This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 371. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? This is Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co-host, Mr. David Green. David, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm really good. I went to did cryotherapy last night with some of the Go Buddies guys. And, what, yeah. what the heck is that? What's you basically sit there and you cry a lot, and it's supposed <laughs> to be therapeutic. No, I'm okay. kidding. It's like <laughs> people using really cold temperatures to try to heal your body. So you do that, like, you know, freeze yourself. And mm. they had all kinds of different things. So we, we did that. Do you feel better? No, I honestly was somewhat <laughs> underwhelmed, if I'm being honest. I, I was expecting I, a lot more. I actually have heard of it before, but I, 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 I kind of put it in the same category as like a lot of like, I mean, I'm not saying the, the like chiropractic or like the, what's the pokey things you put on your body? Acupuncture. Acupuncture, like they might work. I have no idea, but like I kind of put them all in the same category. It's like they seem, some people are really passionate about it and other people are like, that's hokey. So I have not tried it personally. I'm going to get a ton of like hate mail now on my Instagram. <laughs> like, I know. That's what happens when you take a controversial stance. I like know. This. But at least I said, I don't know. I'm just saying I tend to look with suspicion upon a lot of things. But uh, anyway, well, I'm sure you guys can tear me apart. But with that said, that's actually closely related to today's quick, quick tip. tip. It actually has nothing to do with today's quick tip. But today's quick tip is very simple. Here's what I want to encourage you guys to do today. Go out there today in the next 24 hours and i want you to have one conversation with a possible seller not an agent not a uh, uh you know some like not a, a even maybe, maybe a text message but I, I, an actual like, interaction where you say something they say something back whether that means you're door knocking whether it means you're going to call somebody on craigslist a landlord on craigslist and say hey i don't want to rent your house but can i buy it just get in that practice go talk to a seller within 24 hours from right now and uh, if you do that, let us know, uh, post about it on Instagram or on social tag at bigger pockets. Let us know. You can also take David green 24 or beardy Brandon. That is today's quick, quick tip. tip. You know how many people are going to do that? Probably like one out of a hundred that listen to this. Yeah. But, uh, I want to see more people do it. So, I mean, just that, that practice of getting out there and, and doing it, I encourage you guys to do it. And now that's really all I got. So today's show is all about generating leads. Uh, we've got a guest on who's only 20 years old, did 75 deals in the past, what, 18 months, something like that. It, it, the guy is, is a, a, a machine. Uh, and uh, he, uh, no pun intended because of his new business, uh, artificial intelligence stuff. He talks about that a little bit later in the show as well. And uh, he, he has got some stuff figured out in terms of lead gen and why that's one of the most, if not the most important things a real estate investor can learn how to do. Uh, so uh, tons of good actionable advice today. So grab a pen and paper, take some notes today and let's get into it. David, anything you want to say before we get into it? Yeah. One thing, if you're a bigger pockets pro or premium member, then you can buy BPCon 2020 tickets today. So check your inbox for more information because Brandon and I hope to hang out with you in New Orleans, October 5th and 6th. If you're not a pro or premium member, stay tuned and we'll announce when you can get tickets because they're gonna go on sale for everybody later. We had an awesome time last year in Nashville. Some people said it changed their life and you got to see Brandon and I pretty much like all day long hanging out and talking to everybody. So if you're a pro or premium member, go grab some tickets because you're not going to wanna miss out. All right, here we go, five, four, three, two. All right, Will, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast, man. Good to have you here. Thanks, man. Happy to be here. Sweet. All right. So let's talk about your real estate journey. I mean, you're you're a young guy. I mean, you're how old? Do you mind me asking? 20. Is that rude? 20. Yeah. All right. All right. So you're you might be you know, you might he might be the youngest one we've had on the podcast. I'm not sure. I don't I don't know if we've had a, a 20. I know we had a 21. I don't know. I'm probably missing somebody. But tell us how you got started in real estate so many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, man, it feels so long ago. October 2016. All I right. Went to one of these mastermind things with my mom. Okay. I was like, she kind of knew as an entrepreneur, she knew I kind of want to do that sort of stuff, but neither of my parents were entrepreneurs. Both of them were actually landscape architects. I was never interested in real estate. It bored me. You know, I want to play video games because I, I could do things quicker. I could move up quicker. I could acquire more things. I was like, real estate, that's too adult. Like, that's too slow. So I go to this event and it's a three day seminar, um, like your classic one and it gets to the end of it and you know, we're hooked. And I didn't know anything about it. They're really good there. And some of them, yeah. they're really good. And at the end of it, we basically go back and talk to my dad and he's like, you guys are crazy. We're not spending $2,000 on this. And then they kind of helped us see reason. We're like, oh yeah, probably doesn't make sense to spend 20,000 on this. So 
I was salty for a couple months from October to November, then December, this is of 2016. And then January of 2017, I always like, always love to play video games. And I was playing Grand Theft Auto. Are you guys nice. familiar? I love the Grand Theft Auto. Drive around cars and things like that. And, and do good deeds for people. Things. Drive around, yes. do good deeds, help people yes. cross the road and stuff. Yeah, it's a good game. Uh-huh. How many points do you get for helping little old ladies cross the street? In that game? <laughs> you get quite a few. It, it just doubles your score for the day. It's like okay. my score. That's so they thought. came out with this update where you could buy properties and they would like cash flow and you could start to stack them, right? Just like in real estate. And I was playing there and this thought hit me. I remember the exact moment I was like riding my motorcycle or whatever. I was like, you know what? What did am you have I- a gun doing? in your hand? <laughs> I, I don't remember which one. I know I okay. did. Okay, okay. I want to do this in real life. You know what I mean, it's like, <laughs> I want to at this point, I'm getting bored. I see this isn't going anywhere. And I kind of had like the life that, you know, I was like pretending to live and then the one that I was actually living. Okay. So then and there, right, I finished playing and I unplugged the Xbox. For the note record, I have not plugged it in since then. Wow. And what I did is I went to my room, I went to my desk and started Googling real estate investing with like this fury and started Googling stuff. And I found bigger pockets. And I started looking around. I think I read like the ultimate beginner's guide. And I was like, whoa, yeah. it's more complicated, you know? And so I listened to podcast number 77 with Michael Corals. Mm, yep. Five times in a row. And then I'm like, okay, this is great. So I download all the podcasts. And I think for the next week, I just start at one. I listen to one and I listen to two and I listen to three and then four. But I think I was talking with David. My personality type is I'm a driver, but I'm also like uh, like a big fidgeter. Like, I don't know if it's ADD or something, but I can't just sit there and listen, right? I got to be engaged. And I'm like, okay, I can't drive and do this. I can't do this. I can't read and do this. So what I started doing was I started making little paper cranes with post-it notes as I was listening to podcasts. Does that allowed me to be present and just listen and not kind of like, you know, not necessarily get bored, but allow me to do something. Yeah. So I've got hundreds and hundreds of these paper cranes now in a chest that I made. They're kind of, you know, special to me because it's, it's what I forge. And I would take, I write notes on them and then form them. And that's, that's how I got started and learned about uh, real estate and started the education. That's cool. It's funny you mentioned the fidgeting. I'm actually at this very moment twirling a pen in my fingers. I can't not do it. Every podcast I've ever recorded, I'm twirling a pen in my fingers. That's what I do. Anyway, that's cool though. I mean, like, I love the tangible sign of like, like this is this is the the tangible proof that I did hundreds of hours of education, like to learn this stuff, and I didn't pay twenty thousand uh, dollars for it. What you know? That's cool. All right. So so you got excited. You started learning. You're still young. I mean, like, I don't know any 17, 18 year olds that are, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds jumping into real estate. So what, what happened next? Like, how'd you, how'd you buy your first deal? Oh yeah, absolutely. So my friends thought I was totally weird. I was listening to real estate podcasts in, uh, in high school, you know, they're like, what are you doing, dude? And I was like, man, you know, this is something I'm interested in. So fast forward to that summer, I start taking the action, you know, going, putting out the handwritten bandit signs, not using any technology, not knowing what I'm doing, getting yelled at by people because we put the signs in their yards and they (laughs) weren't very happy with that. And I just started to learn and started to kind of gain traction, start to, you know, just about the taking the action part of it. I wasn't showing any results, but I was more interested in learning the processes than getting an immediate result. So then the next uh, fall, I, I go to college and I go to William and Mary, which is where I went in Virginia for, um, for one year. I do the first semester and I kind of get caught up in college life. But college for me was this playground for startups. I was like, oh, there's an opportunity here and here and here and here. And I think at one point I had like four different startups in college, one where I would pick up trash from my friends like dorm doors for like $2 a week. I'd hire people to go around and picking up trash. And the, the, the bureaucracy shut me down. They said it was a fire hazard. So, <laughs> Here, like all this is like pressuring and they're like, I'm like, I want to do these good things. I'm providing value and they're stopping me. So I read the one thing by Gary Keller because I was working like 13 to 15 hour days and I was not making any progress and I was not going anywhere. And that book was like the medicine I knew I needed. And I kid you not, I read that. And that same day I withdrew all like my positions from different clubs I was in. I'd stopped all my startups, shut down websites. Wow. realized that I had to focus on the one thing that I had had in my mind for the last year and a half, which was real estate. But I had all these reasons why I couldn't do it. And I went to our library. I went to the third floor, the corner little room, kind of like this one, no windows. And I started making cold calls. I started getting on the dialer, started to listen to more podcasts and just became hyper intentional and focused as to, okay, this is the thing I'm going to do. 
and I'm not going to give another option because I know it can be done. I've heard it on 250 podcasts. Why shouldn't I be able to do it? Yeah, that that skill right there, the ability to say, you know what, I'm going to shut down everything else that I have going on, even though they're all good ideas. And I'm going to focus on this thing, because if I just do this right, everything else becomes non-important. I don't even need to do the other things because this is the one thing. It's like I use the analogy a lot. And I said it at the BP conference last year in uh, 2019. But I said, like, people are always building bridges from where they are today to where they want to get to like financial freedom Island. And so they're building this bridge and then they get like 20 feet into the bridge and then they start building another bridge and then they start building another bridge. And pretty soon they got 50 bridges trying to span this distance. And because you've got 50 bridges, each one only moves a foot every year versus if you had one bridge and you focused your energy on that. So uh, kudos to you for recognizing that set like, Hey, like, if I have multiple things, I'm not going to get anywhere. The very first quote, the very first line in, in uh, the one thing uh, is a quote from, I don't even know who said it, but if you chase two rabbits, you'll catch neither or you'll catch, you won't catch any. Uh, so very cool. Okay. So you said real estate, that's the thing. I'm going to go into it. I started making cold calls. I mean, like, what were you, who were you calling? What were you saying? Like, was that terrifying as it would be for me? <laughs> like, so, uh, yeah. And I would live Williamsburg, like colonial Williamsburg, which is where William and Mary is, is all really nice houses. And it's like a retirement community. So it's all like really nice houses where there are old people who don't want to be bothered. And I just kept calling and I started looking, you know, I was like, okay, how do you make an offer? Like 65% of the Z estimate, make it an offer. And I just felt wrong. I was just like, this I must be doing something wrong because I just don't feel like there's a fit here. I'm not providing value to these people don't have problems. The only problem they have is me calling them and taking their time. So I started to really learn to iterate, but it was, you know, it's in that muscle, you know, people talk to me and they're like, you know, Hey, what should I do? And usually the first thing I say is I'm more than happy to help you. And what I want you to do is go out this weekend and door knock a hundred doors. Because if you can't get over the fear of rejection first, I guess that'd be a tip to, to anyone who's looking to get their first deal, go and door knock 100 doors. Because the problems that lie between you and like doing deals have nothing to do with the market, have nothing to do with your knowledge base. But if you can't go out and knock on 100 doors, just download a simple script and say, I'm interested in buying your property, would you entertain an offer? Then that's something you got to look at for yourself. And that's always going to be there. And you're going to focus on building the other bridges and not work on that one. And it's going to hold you back. Well, let me ask you, when you first made that decision, hey, I'm going to go full time. I'm not going to just play this video game. How old were you? January of 2017 would have made me 18. Okay. So you're 18 years old. You unplug that Xbox and you strike out to a brave new world. I want to kind of back up and just ask, do you think that you were successful because you just didn't know you weren't supposed to be? I wasn't supposed to be. Well, at 18 years old, you're not supposed to be able to figure out real estate investing. That's like common <laughs> conventional wisdom, right? I don't know. I, I don't know if I have the answer to that. I think I was just frustrated with the different paths that I saw that were open to me at the time. Uh -huh. And I didn't have entrepreneurs. I didn't have mentors in my life. I didn't have people I could talk about these things to. And I, you know, I started to get on the podcast. And it's like kind of, you know, Brandon, you and David, and just like this new way of being like this freedom, this not got to do this and complain about this. It was fresh, you know, and it was inviting. I was like, you know, this is a new, this is a new world to live into. And it's one that can, it can sustain me, sustain my family and sustain future ventures that I'll want to go into. So I think it was the desire there. Well, the reason, that, the reason I ask is most people that want to do what you did don't because they have all these self-limiting beliefs in their mind that yeah. I can't do it, this won't work, blah, blah, blah. And at 18, you just hadn't had enough of life tell you that you can't yet to where you actually believe that garbage. And so you went and you made things happen. And we're going to hear more about your story. But for the people that are listening... There really is no excuse that an 18 year old can do it if you're not if you're older than 18 and you're not. It's all the stuff that you've learned along the way that makes you think you can't. And you, whether you realize it or not, intuitively knew this because when you made people go door knock, you basically said, I'm gonna help you get rid of all the garbage you think about fear of rejection and what would they think and I don't know what to do, and just get it all out of the way so that they came to learn from you as a blank slate. Is that more or less why you think you had people doing that? Yeah, and what percentage of them do you think actually went out and did it? Yeah. Oh, I can imagine, man. Did you actually track that? Like 10%. <laughs> yeah, I follow up. Some, someone asked me something, like I, I follow up. I've got, I've got planners on planners. I'm not the most organized person, but I, you know, 
I, I kind of think I'm a, it's a little savagery, but every year, you know, when everyone's posting on Facebook, their new year's resolutions, I write down what they say <laughs> and I'm holding them accountable in the grass, like a tiger, right? In the grass throughout the year, That's just funny. so I can know, right? Like what's this person up to? Are they just talk or do they have walk as well? So that's this little funny thing that I do. That's funny. That's awesome. I love that idea. Yeah, you know, there. Uh, my, I have a performance coach. His name is Jason Drees, and he's always telling me that, like, and, and that, like, most of, I guess, most of success or doing things has nothing to do with the tactics. Like, you kind of mentioned a minute ago, like the strategy. And the, I mean, the tactics, the strategies. Like, that's fine. And like, you can tell these people, go door knock a hundred, a hundred doors, or they have a goal to lose weight or to build a real estate business. But like, it's it's not the tactics or strategy that people struggle with. It's all up here. There's something mental that stops people. Like, do you remember, uh, and David, you brought that good point about like, sometimes you just like, don't know that you're not supposed to or that the norm isn't success. Do you remember we interviewed uh, Kevin Carroll a long time ago? I think it was like episode like two, I looked it up 209. Yeah, he said, I want to flip a hundred houses. Yeah, just... cause he had friends that were flipping a hundred houses. Yeah. So he's just like, so I just went and flipped a hundred houses. And it was like, what, what? No, most people just like flip a house like their first year. He's like, yeah, I didn't know that. So I just assume that everyone flips a hundred houses their first mm-hmm. year. And so we just went and flipped a hundred like that, that, uh, I don't know that, that mentality is just crazy. I, I read another story recently about a lady who was like some kind of like sales trainer or something like that. And she went to a seminar and they said that, uh, the guy, at the, the guy at the seminar was saying, if I teach you this strategy, I'm going to teach you guys today. You'll be able to close 80% of the people you pitch. And so she went out there and followed exactly what he did, worked hard at it, got up to like 50, 60, 70%, couldn't break 70%, uh, well, like 70, 75%. She was like stuck there and she couldn't close more than that. A couple of years later, she went back to this guy and she said, yeah, I, mean, I don't understand. How do you get to 80%? He said, oh, I didn't say 80%. I said 18%. And so it's because she thought he was like 80% was the bar. They would, it just changed her mentality. And she was closing like three times, four times what this guy was. So anyway, it, there's such power in like the way that we think, you know? I just made a video to put on Instagram today because I was listening to our interview with Jocko and I'm like, oh, there's just so much good stuff in here. And I was thinking about how he was talking about if you focus on the target that's too far out there, it's blurry and it's fuzzy and you can't quite see it. So you focus on your front sight and keep the target somewhere in the background. And as you get closer, it comes into focus more. And for somebody like Will, who, and again, we're kind of jumping the the gun here because uh, I know we haven't described what success that he's had. It was really that he just thought 80% was possible, so it happened. And what I like to tell people is prepare for the absolute worst. Expect to knock on 100 doors to get one opportunity. So when the opportunity comes, you give it everything you have, right? Tell yourself, this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. That's okay. I like it. Because if it's anything less than that, you'll be really grateful. You'll be happy. And and most of the people that I see that don't succeed, like I see this a lot for agents that come work on my team or get in real estate, they just thought it would be easier than it is. It's that simple. If you look at people that don't stick with going to the gym, they just thought it would be easier than it was. You know, In general, we set a bar way too low, and then when it wasn't that easy to clear it, we say, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. And for like someone like Will, who just didn't know where the bar is supposed to be set, he's like, well, I'll just go do it, right? Anything's better than not succeeding. He made it happen. And you know, I, I point this out because Brandon and I both did things that we didn't know you weren't supposed to do. Brandon slept on a couch at like seven feet tall so that he could house hack. I started buying in other states without knowing that that was risky and you shouldn't do it. I just never heard anyone say you shouldn't do it. It didn't seem any different to me. And like most of the success we had, I mean, you started basically the podcast for Bigger Pockets and built it up to be this gargantuan thing because no one told you that that was hard to do. You just went out there and did it. So thanks for letting us jump in there, Will, and point out a part of your story that's really great. If you can remember where you were, go ahead and pick it up and run with it again. Yeah, for sure. So so now it's cool, right? So after read the one thing, after making cold calls, it's getting to the point where things are starting to pick up speed. And I'm actually starting to show results and show traction. So I finished my, my first year of school, I think it was May 2nd, 2018. And basically I pack all my stuff in a car and I didn't really, my, my parents, they, their lifelong goal was to like sail on a boat. So when I went to college the year before they sold their house and now they're like kind of living and running a charter business on a, on like a sailboat in the Caribbean, That's cool. which is really cool. Really, really nice family, you know, meetups and vacations, nice warm weather down there. And I pack all my stuff in the car and I drive down cause I had a connection in like Norfolk, Virginia, like the bad area of Norfolk. I then got a place to crash where I have to pay rent on an air mattress in a living room. 
where they had like a bulldog that was like peeing all over the floor and stuff. It was there. And I was like so excited, so excited more than ever before in my life because I felt like I finally had, you know, I didn't have school obligations. I didn't have other obligations. I could just focus. And I started gaining traction. I had a partner at the time. His name was Josh. We basically started working together. We were going to get like probates and things like that, making all these cold calls. I think we went for like three or four weeks just making so many calls. My first deal, I don't think it, I don't know. We can see if we can consider a deal or not because I got a second first deal. The first deal was a, a probate that we went to and I did none of the work, none of the work for the deal. And here's what was great. We went and I had another mentor of mine who I met at a, uh, a RIA. His name is Phil. And we knew that he was flipping houses. So I'd kind of be skipping school and setting up his security systems for him, right? Just how can I add value? How can I add value? How can I add value? And we're like, hey, we got this, but we don't really know how to do it. He says, you guys come along with me to the appointment and you know, I'll handle things that you can watch. I remember it is like just Josh and I were standing awkwardly in our kitchen, right? With our like, hands behind our back while he's negotiating with them on the price. And he's like, you know, do it. We'll throw you a $5,000 commission. Like I'll just pay you out of pocket. So that was the first deal that eventually closes after some hiccups. We didn't handle any of the title. I didn't even know what title was. I didn't know anything like that. And he hands us, uh, he like pays us and we go and we cash it. And we're holding like, like 2000, whatever deposit and like 3000 in cash. Like this is the most cash I've ever held in my entire life. <laughs> we go to the supermarket and we're like, we don't have to budget for food. We've made it. We're rich. We got $3,000 of cash, you know, paying for cash for everything. That was a great feeling. And then things started to get real, right? So we started to pick up traction. Then I basically, I moved to a place that was, um, we knew we had to come, we kind of want to move into the same building as Phil so we could be with proximity. It was like by the waterfront, which for there was, I think like 2000 a month in rent. And our only goal was make enough to pay rent, right? Make enough to pay rent to the next month. And we start talking to people, we get into marketing arrangements, we get into partnerships and start really learning. And here's a huge distinction. At one point, we got, I was on a triple line dialer and then my, my partner was across the room and we were going as hard as we could, as like as far as we could go, as fast as we could with the cold calling. And we had to wait for the calls to come in. So we were playing like mobile games on our phone because again, fidgeting, right? I'm not going to want to sit there and be bored. I was like, there's got to be a better way. We're spending all our time trying to get a lead. And then we got a call with someone through some mutual groups. It was like, yeah, I mean, we can just, it's called marketing. They'll call you. And we're saying, okay, you're going to send out, it was like ringless voicemails at the time. You're going to sound these ringless voicemails. And then from nine to 12 in the morning, sellers are going to call us. They're going to call us saying they want to sell. That would be completely game changing. And I remember I was like, there's no way this is possible, but if it is possible, it's going to change everything. Can you explain real quick what ringless voicemail is? Cause that's a, that's a cool technology that yeah. uh, actually probably drives some people nuts, but from a marketing standpoint, it's amazing. Yeah, for sure. Um, just at a, at a base level, it's a technology that if Brandon's got a cell phone, my technology sends him a voicemail and inserts a voicemail into his voicemail box that I pre-recorded without bringing his phone, without disturbing him. And so he just see, basically sees that he's got a new voicemail in his box. So yeah. it's kind of like direct mail, right? It sits with them. It's not like they have to pick up the phone or not, like a cold call. Maybe they weren't home. But, you know, when they get back, they're going to be able to check their voicemails. Yeah, that's cool. Because then it's not as bad as like a, a robo dialer necessarily where you're interrupting them at dinner with an automated message of the IRS is calling you. Like it's like it's in their voicemail. They can check it later. They're like, oh, I must have missed a call. And they can call you back. Yeah. And, you know, the, and, it, and it worked. And basically we had this guy, you know, again, we were still getting started. We know what we were doing. We had this guy that just like kept calling us back. And we're like, well, this guy's like either like psycho or really motivated. And so we, we called him back. We're like, who, who wants to call me? You know, you or me. So we call this guy. And he's a guy that like moved to the area like seven years ago, whatever, with the military. And he wanted to move back and he like bought cash and like kind of flipped his house a little bit. He's like, you know, I just want, I just want what I paid for it seven years ago. So like, okay, we'll go out and look at it. It's like this little, little, little like kind of ranch type thing. Really, really sweet house. So we're walking around it. And we're like, okay, this is, this seems possible. Uh, did, did we remember to bring a contract? Uh, okay. This is the first time kind of looking through the contract. Like we got it from someone that sent it to us. And he, he was willing to sign it. We're like, okay, let's agree. $25,000. That, that's fine for this house, which I don't know where you might be in the country. But for that, that was like, okay. We had no idea what it was worth, right? He was like, I just want what I paid for. So we're like, okay. Now I go on bigger pockets and I post it because I didn't have any cash buyers list. Yeah. I had two people that messaged me about it. One person uh, and then another person. 
And the first person we said, okay, come out, you know, let's take a look at it, you know, whatever, 8 a.m. tomorrow. So he comes out, walks through, I think like after we're talking to people, we didn't realize, but the lot was buildable and that builders were buying lots for 50 to 60,000 there, the lot itself. Oh, wow. And the house was in pretty good shape. Like it was in pretty good shape. So we basically get this first guy, first guy, we're like, so, you know, you ready to do it? We're asking 60,000. He's like, ah, uh, let me go over my numbers. We're like, all right, man, but I got to tell you another guy's coming here five minutes later. So the other guy comes and I, I still, I'm still in touch with this guy. And I went actually back to visit him in the house once he had flipped it to see kind of what he'd done with it. And he comes in, he's doing, he said, he like gets his dad over. Cause there's still like old knob and tube wiring in the roof. And we're like, please don't be like, please be updated again. We didn't know anything. So he's like, yeah, um, can you do like 55 or he's, we were asking 65,000. He's like, can you do 60,000? I said, we do 60,000. If you take your $5,000 earnest money and you go drop it off at title today, I've got the assignment here. We, we assigned the contract on the hood of his car and pretty much we're just dumbfounded. And we're like, now what do we do? Yeah. And you got it for 25, you said, right? 25. Yep. That's awesome. So I got to tell you, so that one, the total, I think the, the assignment fee on that, we were in like a 50, 50 split with the person that was funding the marketing at the time was like, was like 30,000, 32,000. And so we got half of that. And so that 16,000 check, I remember I think I posted a video, like, you know, drive into the bank to cash it. It was great, but it did not come easy. Every yeah. single thing that could have gone wrong, went wrong. Primarily because the seller did not know real estate and we did not know real estate either. So you got two parties of a transaction. It's the buyer's first time buying a house and no one knows what they're doing. So <laughs> they were asking me a question because he like, we had title, right? And he went to the, our seller went to the title company and he's calling me freaking out. Like, why is there not a check at title? Why is there not a check at title? I'm like, uh, I don't really know. Let me find out. I didn't know that Virginia was a recorded dispersed the next day state. So there's so many things that I didn't learn. And it's basically, he started getting super pissed off and we ended up giving him his whole whole thing is they kind of wanted like a, he wanted like three days to move out his stuff, but he needed the money to move out of his stuff. So we ended up just saying, what can we do to solve this? Like he was super frustrated on the phone and we we're like, this, is, this must be a big misunderstanding. Like what if we increase the purchase price $5,000 and, and kind of gave that to you as an advance through escrow? Because that's what our attorney recommended us to do. He's like, oh, that takes care of everything. That covers my moving costs. And then we close the deal. But it was, we were in every cent and everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of lessons in there. But I'm, I'm curious of like, looking back now that you've done this now for a couple of years uh, and you've done more deals. For those people who are in your shoes or where you were then, they don't know anything. And so they, they, they are saying, I'm not, they, they don't, they choose not to invest in real estate. They choose not to take action because they don't know the whole thing. I use the analogy of driving through fog all the time. Like you can't see a mile down the road. So people stop driving. I mean, we would never do that in real life, but with real estate, you can't see a mile down the road. So you pull over and you stop driving because you don't know the whole picture. But you were just like, no, nah, we're gonna keep driving through this fog. We'll figure it out as we go. So what kind of advice do you have for people that are in your shoes uh, a couple of years ago that don't know everything and they're freaked out about having those like the seller upset or not understanding the local, like how this works or how title works or how escrow works? Yeah, for sure. And I think it's kind of like the, you know, my, my common thing and what I've been able to articulate is are your reasons and justifications greater to you than your dreams and your wishes on what you want your life to be? Everyone's got reasons. Everyone's just got justifications. You know, we live in an extremely justified world. You're wrong. I'm right. We got to do this. And everyone's telling you different things. But at the end of the day, right, if you had control, right, hypothetically, if you had control of your life, which we all know that when you take react, uh, action and responsibility, you get that control or your reasons and the justifications and all the things you're worrying about. Oh, well, I got to pay this. I got to do that. I got to pay rent. I got to do this. And I'm not old enough. and I'm not this and I'm not that. All those reasons, which you ask a random person on the street and they would say, oh, you're completely justified. What I did in my mind is I said, okay, let me stop asking like in that. Let me stop saying what was, what was it if it was a random person on the street? Let me say, what if it was someone I really looked up to? What if it was someone admired? Would they say that those reasons are still justified? So are you like, what you want to do with your life? This is what was so difficult for me because it was a burning passion for me. Like I want to create my life the way I want it. I think a lot of people say they do and they're comfortable where they are. And there's a payoff from complaining, right? Because then you get to be with other people at the bottom of the mountain 
always saying something could be some way else. So that's like, it's kind of direct. And, you know, if that, if that's, it's, that's like bringing up something in someone, then I would just take a look, you know, if, if you're listening to this, just like, is there a truthful element? Because I do know one thing, if something like kind of frustrates you or, or confronts you, I, it wouldn't confront you, Brandon, if I said your beard wasn't the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I mean, cause you know, that's true. Like it's, I know it, I, I got this. <laughs> if you had issue with it, right. Or if you were yes. insecure about it, then it might confront something. Yes. So it, it, are your dreams like greater to you than your reason justifications? I notice to show up when people say, don't judge me. I don't want to be judged, but we only refer to that when someone's saying something we don't want to hear. I've never heard someone say, wow, you're really handsome. And someone go, don't you dare judge me. Who are you to tell me that? <laughs> right. <laughs> but if it's, you look ugly today, that might come out. Yeah. And, and it kind of ties into the extreme ownership stuff we talk about, where if you're only willing to accept what makes you feel good and not what makes you feel bad, you're never going to improve. And, and that's what, that's what made, made me think of that as you were talking, because the answers for what most of us need to be more successful are all around us. People are trying to tell us it. the universe is trying to tell us that. Uh, and we are the ones who don't want to hear it. It's really us that gets in the way of our own success. And you hit a very good point there, Will, when you said it's because we take comfort in making excuses. We don't actually want to be successful. We want someone to give us permission to not be successful because that's easier. If you guys want to hear more about that whole idea of extreme ownership, that was on show 365 we did with Jocko. Will, I realize we haven't actually asked you what you're doing as to as we've been listening to you tell us how you did it can you give us an overview of the businesses that you're running uh, how many deals you're doing where are you making your money yeah oh no you call my bluff it's time for me to go <laughs> <laughs> i got this far uh no so since july i'm mean, just like that one i told you like the thirty thousand. i would say that's our first deal from then until now we have some closings this week and next week i got my I got my pipeline up here 75 deals wow Dealing. Seven hundred and seventy thousand four hundred one dollars and six cents in collected assignment fees. Wow, seven! Wow, that's crazy. So seventy? How many deals? Seventy? That's crazy. Seventy-five. Seventy-five deals, and those are wholesale deals. Any of those flips? Any of those rentals? Or are those primarily wholesaling? Yeah. So I've never actually flipped a house. Yeah, that's I that's either, not a bad thing. I either wholesale or I'll take it down creatively myself. So those are just wholesale deals. Though it doesn't include, I own nine units that I've bought creatively financed through subject to owner financing. And then I think there's one that I bird. Well, I guess, did that, does that count as, maybe I did like light eh. to it. Sure. Well, on your subject to deals, did you run into any trouble with the title company actually? How did you get around that? Because I've heard people say the title companies don't want to do subject to deals anymore. Yeah. So I think that's a great intro is I went through like four different title companies and my, my team, we do not like when we have to use another title company because I sat down after having like a, you know, a terrible experience with our first one and just being like so frustrated. I sat down and I found a, a title company that was referred to me by a friend where the, the two brothers are, are Marines or ex-Marines. And I basically sat down with them across from a desk and just drilled them with questions. What do you do in this case? What do you do in this case? What do you do in this case? Basically just my like list of things that used to frustrate me. And it was night and day to me. And I was asked, what do you do in this case? I found a title company that wanted to work with me and that they were knowledgeable and that they were able to provide the things that we were looking for. That's my answer to that is yeah. I found a title company that could do it, knew how to do it, has done it before and did it the right way consistently. That advice right there is like solid, not just with, with title companies, but with agents, with attorneys, with whatever, like there's usually somebody, I mean, unless you're trying to do something completely illegal, but like, and even then I'm sure that, you, that this, this advice applies, but there's always somebody willing to do it. There's always somebody who, and a lot of times people, people say we don't do that. It's because they just haven't done it in the past and they don't want to learn how to do it. And so they just, they just don't do it. And so yeah. uh, if you ask around enough, again, the same thing applies to lenders, right? Oh yeah, you're not, we, we can't get you a loan. You haven't had a job for two years. Go to the next lender. Yeah, we can't get you a loan. You haven't had the same job for two years. Next lender. Oh yeah, we actually have a program for people who can uh, who have less than two years at the job. Great, right? But the other banks will tell you, no, it's not possible. They won't tell you to go to another bank. They'll just say it's not possible. And yeah. so like never believe what like a bank says or uh, like when they're talking about in generalities, like yeah, their program might not do it, but those people are so like narrow-minded in every industry that they assume that the entire industry believes what they believe rather than believing that there's other options out there. So yeah, 
Very cool. So you, 75 deals in a year and you're 20 years old, which- Year and a half. Year and a half. Okay. In the first year and a half at 20 years old, which is, which is crazy. I want to go into the nitty gritty how to, because the people listening to this show are like, you know, they might not be 20, it might be 30, might be 50, but they're like, I want to make $700,000 in assignment fees. Uh, But before we get there, I want to go into the nitty gritty, how you're doing it, what you're doing for lead gen, who answers the phone calls, what your team looks like. I want to go through all that. But first, what the heck is wholesaling? For those people who have never heard the term before, let's, let's get it on a, the same page as how are you making money without flipping these houses, without owning them as rentals? What does that mean? Yeah, hundred percent. So and a distilled version, basically the theory of it is that someone has a property that either they inherited it or it needs a ton of work or there's some emotional like disattachment to it. Like someone died, they just don't want to deal with it, that they are willing to trade a slice of their equity in that property for the speed and convenience of being able to sell it quickly and hassle-free. So wholesaling and being a wholesaler is the opportunity to go in and have authentic communication to find out what's important to someone, not try and tell someone what they need, not try and trick them as to what their property is worth. We only ask questions, right? And it's say it's contracting a property with a purchase and sale agreement and then either assigning it to an end buyer who's going to be in a flipper, who's going to be a buy and holder, who's going to be one of maybe someone more of the sophisticated people in the market who has their own cash or closing on it yourself and then turning around and reselling it. Wholesaling is just the exit strategy. What blew my mind the first 12 months is that here's, here's like the biggest thing. This is the thing I really want to say. I listened to 150 of the podcasts, right? And I was taking notes on each one. Okay. And I was writing down all the things that everyone had and what they were still looking for. So they had money, they had network, they had connections, they had track record, they had all that stuff. They've weathered the 08 recession. And there was one thing that still was the bottleneck for every single guest you guys had on here. And it was their deal flow. Mm -hmm. It was the ability to get good discounted deals into their pipeline consistently. And so what I realized is, wow, if I can build a business just around that, I know I can do this because it's not a function of having money. It's not a function of having a network. It's not a function of having a track record because those guys have those things and they still need this. So I knew right away, if it's terms of value proposition, finding the deal and wholesaling is simply the way to then sell the deal, take some of those funds, put it back into marketing and build your database. It's so good. Here's, here's why this is so important. I want everyone to understand this. Like uh, we, t- we talked to Cal Newport, uh, I don't know, like a year ago on the podcast here. And he's wrote a couple of my favorite books. One's called so good. They can't ignore you. And in that book, he makes this point that if you want true, like financial success and freedom and all that, like, it's not about finding some gimmick way to like, you know, sell some random product that you get lucky. And like, I mean, yeah, some people have gotten lucky and made money that way. But he's like, if you really want success in life, develop rare and valuable skills. Like what in the marketplace is rare and valuable? And in real estate, the most rare and valuable skill a person can have is finding deals. Like that's it today. Now in 2012, that might've been different. The rare and valuable skill then was being able to finance deals. But today it's how do you find good deals? And if you would just devote your time and effort to that, you will never struggle uh, in this, at least in this market, like cycle, you're not going to ever have a problem because there's a million people out there who want a deal. And there's like 1% of them that have the patience, endurance mindset to go out and actually do that to go find a good deal. So it sounds like that's what you did is you're like, Hey, I'm going to go and learn how to build deal flow. Is that right? Cause that's it. There's really no other part of the business, yeah. right? I mean, you could say like, here's all the different things. And even still, as you scale up into multifamily, it's still just deal flow. It starts in real estate. It starts with an opportunity. You don't have an opportunity. You're not going to be doing legal. You're not going to be doing accounting. You're not going to be doing finance. Yeah. You, don't, you can't finance nothing. You can't go get a loan from a bank on a nothing burger deal. <laughs> Start with a deal and then you can get a loan from whoever the heck you want because it's such a good deal. And yeah. I always make that point that like the better deal you have, the easier is the finance, right? Like, I mean, imagine like I have a million dollar house. I'm going to sell it to you for 20 grand. If you don't have 20 grand, I'm guessing you'll find a way to come up with 20 grand. You'll figure something out because you can you make a million dollars on it. Like ever, nobody yep. has a problem thinking of a creative way to buy a house for 20 grand that's worth a million. If you're trying to buy a million dollar house for a million too, you're never going to get a loan on that because why would you overpay? That's stupid. So the better deal you have 
the easier find a thing, which goes back again, the most rare and valuable skill you can have in real estate is finding good deals because that makes everything else easier. That is your one thing. And that's what wholesaling is kind of fun. It's also important to point out that that is a principle that works for all of business. This isn't just real estate. If you can get your Legion. brain to think that way, you'll yeah. be very successful. If you work at a company and you're the person who greets people that walk in the front door and you get them a cup of coffee and you go tell someone else your, your lead is here, you are valuable. The company probably wouldn't work well without you. You are not as valuable as the lead, the lead generator who got someone to get that person to come in for the appointment to possibly spend money. And the principle there is that finding opportunity, generating business is the most valuable thing you can do in any company, in any business that there is. And if you control that, everybody works for you because they all need what you have. You have the opportunity. You have the revenue. They will play a piece in this puzzle to help you to do it. If you start off saying, well, I really want to learn how to manage properties or I really want to know how, how to do a rehab, that's cool. It's not the most important part. You're going to end up working for the person that has the deal if you get good at doing that. And I like to highlight that because if you're the person that – it's the same as being a real estate agent. I have all the leads come my way. So I have opportunities to hire admin and hire buyer's agents because all the opportunity comes through me because I found the lead. I could have got really good at being a transaction coordinator. It wouldn't have been a whole lot of value to bring – to someone else. So when you're thinking of, hey, I want to get into real estate investing, the first thing you should be thinking is exactly what Will did. How do I get leads, deals, opportunity, and then everything else is a secondary problem or a tertiary problem? All right. You guys want to know how in Let's 2020? Yeah, I do. How are you doing it? So, so if you got listeners, right, you got a bunch of people spending twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars on direct mail. And this is like a lot of people think you have to spend a lot of money to do this or that you need to be super intelligent but I've gone and done the work. And this is my, this is my way of giving back. This is my value for what, for what bigger pockets gave me. I'm going to show you the guys like the couple pieces of technology that I use, the specific ones that I use. And in conjunction with all of them and a couple key players on the team, I basically spend 15 to 30 minutes per deal that we close maximum. Now I live in California my team's in Virginia and, and they close and everything's, everything's smooth and it's able to fund what I'm, I'm doing out here, which I'll talk about later. That's cool. So November of last year, so last last year, New Year's screwing with me. Um, <laughs> I hired my first, my first uh, employee ever. Her name's Sydney and she's still with me and she's an administrative assistant because I recognize my personality type. I'm a driver. I'm a go-getter. I want to move forward. I want to only focus on that. And there's the rest of the business that has to be cleaned up. So a lot of people think that technology is going to be the answer to everything that I can tell you because we're in it. AI is not there yet. You can't have intelligent systems yet. You, what I have done is I don't think I use any of the technology I'm going to talk about as it's intended to be used. I use it for its core component, what it does best at, and it plugs into the rest of my system so that it's simple. Three rules, right? Keep it simple, stupid, focus on the one thing, and abide by the 80 20 rule every single time always if you don't know what that is that's 80 percent of the output from 20 percent of the input 80 percent of cold callers in an office are only going to generate 20 percent of the revenue i read this in like i listened to 80 20 rules of like sales and marketing that, yeah so good and i was working out at the time and i was listening to it and i think i just like dropped the weights when they said this line when it was like inside 80 20 there's another 80 20 4% of what you do generates 64% of your total results. And that's with cars on the road and sap in the trees or anywhere else you look in the universe. So I use the same thing in technology. I don't like big fancy systems. I don't like things that are like, oh, and here's all the features, right? When it comes to the operations, I want streamlined and I want simple and I want it be able to be easy so I can train the next person on how to do it. So let's start with lead gen. Lead gen is... What the methods we're using right now are text message, ringless voicemails, and mail to targeted lists. That is not new to most people hearing here. I'm going to share the specific companies that I use. But moreover, I'm going to kind of let that there right now just to show you that I'm doing this using the same thing everyone else is doing. And it's not just a function of lead gen, but it's a couple pieces together. Lead gen comes in. Now, I'm a big believer. And I'm a practical person and I like to optimize things. I don't think a lead has slipped through our cracks in the last 12 months since we got these systems up and running. The key to this business is building a system 
that either you're using a CRM or whatever you're using, that nothing slips through the cracks and that you are on of and aggressive with a follow up on each and every single lead that comes in. Because if you don't, you're basically paying an extremely high water bill, right? To get that water flowing for those leads. You're paying all this 20, 30, $40,000 a month. And then it's going into a bucket that's got a big hole in the bottom. And why can I not get deals? But most people, most people, right? They started with construction. And then they needed lead gen. So they had their construction business and then they needed to add lead gen. So they were like, okay, we don't have the time. We don't have the system set up. Let's just see if it's a lead or not when it comes in and then either buy it or don't buy it and get on to the next one. The key here is build a bucket and tape all the holes and having someone manage it so that no lead escapes unless their house has sold or they've explicitly asked us to stop calling. They are in there. And they're going to get followed up with every day until we reach them. Every couple of days after we reach them every week, every month, every three months, every six months. So the system that I use, I'm going to give a big shout out to these guys because they originally had it on Podio and Podio has all these different things that you got to configure. And they built their standalone system that is really good at some things and really kind of buggy at some other things. But the one thing it could do is track those leads and it had simple. It didn't have any of the fluff. It just had, here's the notes. Here's exactly on. Here's the stage of the lead. And here's who it's assigned to on the team. That's investor fuse. So investor fuse leads come in. It's not going to work. It's not going to generate leads. They're different silo to the business. Now we have our, the specific technology we use for the lead generation to get them in the bucket, because here's one thing to note, no technology again, right now is going to be able to follow up with and nurture your leads to the extent that a well-trained and hungry and empathetic acquisition manager can. I'm not saying that technology is not possible in the future. I'm just saying it doesn't exist right now. And trying to use automated follow-up campaigns, that's not what I'm about. I'm about getting on the phone and talking to people. So the systems works. I've got the lead gen things. The text message one is called Lead Sherpa. We actually just started using them a couple of weeks ago. It's like PCPA compliant text messaging. And what we'll go through and do is we'll get a courthouse list. I don't want a text message. I don't want to pay 12 cents per skip trace for a list of a hundred thousand, but we'll go through and we'll get the specific list and then we'll skip through their system and text. And I think there's like the numbers that they're showing, like 93% of people responding, like text message, you see some influencers like Gary Vee, that's where they're moving to. That's where yeah. it's, it's going. So that has been working for us because you either get a yes or no right away. And if it's a yes, then you have a conversation and it's, it's there, you know, it's, it's right there at their phone. They just text. Yeah. I'm interested. What can you offer? Yeah. What does your text? What does the text say? Yeah. So we, what's cool is you basically can have like some like pre form filled ones. I believe I have my acquisition manager handle it, but it's basically like, Hey, this is Tyler. And I was, I was looking for Brandon and I wanted to call to see or I wanted to shoot you a quick text here to see if you might consider an offer on your property at one, two, three main street in Hawaii. That's it. And they either say yes or no. If no, it automatically takes them off the list. I think their system has intelligence to do that. And if yes, they're like, well, yeah, well, it's your offer. Then just quick qualification. Okay. You know, tell them about the rehab, tell them about that all through text. Yeah. So that has been working very well. And I don't have the exact numbers like cost per lead. Cause again, I'm, I'm like, so like forward thinking like, all right, let's, I want to see how many leads we're doing our deals we're doing per month. But it, it, you, it's not comparing to anything else right now in the market. Yeah, that's cool. It's, so go ahead. I like that you're pointing out that tech is not replacing the job of a human, but it is enabling you to do it better. I see a lot of people that are like, hey, David, I'm working on this platform. It's going to scrub the internet for leads. It's going to analyze the lead for you. It's going to talk to the seller. It's going to put it under contract. It's going to arrange everything. And you're just going to sit at yeah. home with a Mai Tai in your hand and do nothing. And then you're going to yeah. get titled to a property. And I just think like it's almost annoying that you're looking for an answer like that because it will never work. The seller of the property is not going to sell something to a bot that they don't know. Now, you can use technology to make it easier for you to do that job. Like what you're saying, you're pre-screening people, you're gathering information, what's the rehab going to be so that you can then look at it and then you have the phone call and you form a relationship with that person to get the property. That is the way that people should be looking at how to use tech. It's to enhance what they're doing. It's not to replace the actual work you still have to do. 100%. And it allows you to scale, right? Whenever I would look at an opportunity, I'm looking at scale. 
okay, you can do it once. How scalable is flipping houses? I got into so many arguments in the beginning, right? Because I was still just, I would, I would say debates, not really arguments. Well, you know, with people at RIA's and basically what it's come down to in kind of my first question now is, well, what are your goals, right? Because if your goals are, you know, you want to flip a hundred houses, then obviously you got to flip a hundred houses. But if your goals are, how do you build a business that brings you twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month? You don't have a ton of capital tied into it. Your overall risk is very low and it's kind of streamlined and you can adapt quicker. Then at scale, I think wholesaling wins. I think wholesaling wins because of the lack of infrastructure that you need. You need infrastructure for flipping houses. You need those contractors. You need all that money. You need all that. You don't need any of that for wholesaling. And people could not believe how much like money I'd be like leaving on the table. Like we wholesaled 75 deals. Do you know what that would be if I like for seven, I'd probably, I'd probably like three or 4 million in revenue if I flipped it myself. But if I flipped it myself, I probably would have done 12 or 15. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I would have done 77. The, the cool thing about that is you're just really like, you're focusing on your strength, which is, you know, in this case, lead gen, like you're just doing the lead gen. Cause otherwise if you're going to flip and I'm not, I love flipping houses, but like when I'm flipping houses, I got to be good at lead gen. I also got to be good at the follow-up at closing uh, the title and escrow stuff. And then the contractor stuff and then the selling stuff and get the, all that. Like I have to be good at everything. Uh, yeah. And so as wholesaling, you got to understand everything. Cause you can't just go and give a crap deal to somebody. You got to understand what makes a deal, but you don't have to know how to manage a contractor. You don't have to know how to keep things on budget and on time. Now, I will, I will say this, like, just because we like to give this warning when we're talking about wholesaling is that there are some states uh, that uh, specifically Ohio has had uh, some issues in, in Florida, and there are probably others that have been like, no, you can't wholesale in the state. You can only, unless you have a real estate license. And there's, there's other some legalities in different areas. So just make sure you guys, you know, do your homework, do it correctly, do it legally, and don't do anything that's going to get you in trouble. But uh, if you can be the person to find good deals, I mean, it's a valuable skill. And here's kind of like in terms of job security, right? People will always have a problem with their house. People will always inherit a yeah. house that they don't want. You know what I mean? Most millennials are living in cities now. What are they going to do with uh, the house they inherited from their grandparents that's in the middle of Kansas and they live in Denver? What are they going to do with it? You think they're going to go learn how to flip a house and flip it? No, they're going to want to sell it. So there's always going to be deals. So even if assignments of contracts get banned, what's to stop you from just being able to close on it and list it on the MLS? Yeah. Give them the speed and convenience that wholesaling would and still turn around and sell it. Now you need to get funds. Now it's, I mean, every industry adapts, but people are never going to stop having issues with their houses. Yeah. Agreed. Because yeah, uh, what a wholesaler does is they solve problems. Now where the legality issue comes from is people are saying, well, you're practicing real estate without a license and you're, you're, or not even you're, you're engaging in brokering because like, that's what an agent does is they in between and there's a lot less regulation. So I, I think at wholesaling, we're going to see more and more, uh, rules, not necessarily outline it, but more and more rules yeah. and guidelines and, and oversight because it's just been kind of a wild west. It'll be defined in more in the future. Yes. Yeah, and that will yeah. eventually probably happen. But right now it's still a little bit wild west. Uh, that said, you shouldn't treat it as like a wild west thing. I mean, treat it like a business like you clearly are, Will. And, you know. And, one, you know, on top of that, I got, I got my buddy Warren over there on the shelf, Warren Buffett. I read that book when I was like 16. I was, I did not understand half of it. <laughs> He has a famous quote, right? When everybody's getting in, it's time to get out. When everybody's getting out, it's time to get in. And just by the pure amount of Facebook messages and people that are just like, hey, you know, I want to get started. I want to get started. I want to get started. It's economics. The more people, right, that tighter the deals, the more people that get into it that don't know what they're doing, that didn't consult an attorney, that screw some seller over big time, maybe even unintentionally. And that's where laws come in, right? So it's kind of, that's the direction that it's, uh, it's heading kind of like everything is for regulation. Because wholesaling, when, I mean, it really didn't exist before like 2010, right? In, in like at the scale it is now, yeah. as far as I believe. But now it's, it's, it's an incredible opportunity. Like I seriously feel like to go back, if you're starting with no network, no connections, but you've got hustle and you can talk to people and you can think of at least systems oriented or partner with someone who can think with systems, there is more than enough technology and you're not going to be able to find a better wealth generator and a way to get into the real estate business and learn what's up than to start a wholesale business and fail forward and fail fast and fail so many times until you get to the point where I want to fail more than anyone else in any room. Like I want to have failed, right? At, at 20, I want to be able to fail more than the guy who's 60 there in the room. 
because that's that's just traction. I've I've said it many times before. I you take away those 77 deals, right? Take away, take away all that, take away all my properties that I own. Six months later, I'd have it all back and more because I've got the lessons and no market crash, nothing, no person can take away the lessons that I've learned and the knowledge about how to put this thing together and what's working. No one Makes can sense. take it away. So for me, you know, I'm going on to, to different, different ventures now with it, right? When it comes to scalability, but this has been the greatest stepping stone, but it's, it's my fallback. I know that at any point in my life, say everything goes south, right? <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't, it's any, so long as I'm not incapacitated, you can drop me off at any major metropolitan area in the country. And I will be able to have it back up and running in two to three months. That's security to me. That's like what most people rely on a diploma for. That's why I said, I'd rather rely on that than a piece of paper that's going to become worth like worth less and less as the years go on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, earlier we talked about this, I gave the analogy with the bridge building, right? Building bridges across um, the island and people do too many things. Now, you built up this wholesaling business and you're kind of the visionary, to use a term from the book, Traction. Like you're the visionary, you're, you're guiding the vision, you hired some people. So now you have a team of people, I'm assuming, that's working this business for you, correct? So what, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, what's so, your team look like today? Yeah, on that I, side? I learned a valuable lesson last year and this is one I never thought I'd learn, is that it is possible to grow out of scarcity. What do you mean? Let that sit in because most people contract out of scarcity, right? I need to do less. For me, it was June and I was moving out here to California to build our tech startup. And I knew that our, we'd have more and more expenses and that I wasn't going to have enough money. The word enough, like not enough, big indicator of scarcity. So I started talking to people and we got super aggressive because we've had things working in Virginia for a long time. And I opened up in Baltimore and I opened up in Houston and I opened up in Dallas and I opened up in Florida all simultaneously, all pretty much with new, new guys who I thought were like me, who'd be able to figure it out. Wow. Was that a lesson learned? Because I basically quintupled my marketing costs and the people that I had in place in Virginia, I was able to train them hands on. Hey, here's what you do. But from afar and five at a time, I found my time getting sucked up into like disputes of, wow, you know, this isn't working or he said this about this person. And we completely took our eye off the ball. I learned that lesson last summer and it, and it was costly. It was very, very costly. I spent all that. It wasn't just the funds. Like it doesn't cost that much to start up in any new market. My time and energy, my focus lost. Like I got, took my eye off the ball. So that's what growth out of scarcity looks like. I said, okay, I don't have enough funds right now coming in to be able to build this thing to what I want. We need to grow more. And there were so many lessons inside of that. So scaled it all Scaled it all down back to our core, like down, like upsize in three months, downsize in three months, right? <laughs> and now my, my entire team, it's like as, as lean as can be, is my one administrative assistant who is my transaction coordinator. She's my lead manager. She's everything. She's my problem solver. She's everything. She like sends out the contract. She's great. Sydney, I love you. Um, and I got one acquisition manager. I had two, one of the guy he kind of wanted to go on to other things because he saw I was kind of winding it down, um, which some people would say would be crazy. And I would probably say I'd be absolutely crazy. Um, I'll talk about that in a second as to why, how could I possibly be winding down something that's generating me 20 or 30,000 a month, bottom line? Like, like how in any logical world does that make sense to do? And I talked yeah. to so many people, and maybe, I, maybe it's, it would be a good conversation. Um, but one acquisition manager, Tyler, he's the baller. And I think he was actually on your mobile home scouting team. Oh, nice. Making a lot of those people. And, but Tyler, here's a funny story with him. He was a fifth year at the fraternity I was in college. I was in the fraternity for one year. So I think he and I had met at like one of the alumni stuff. Spent five years learning to get an accounting degree. And there's people in college listening to this. Listen to this. Spent five years to get an accounting degree. And he met, he sat down with me in like December, going into his first winter of accounting work at like one of the, one of the big four accounting firms. And I started telling him, I posted a little video based on talking about what I did. He's like, no way you're not doing that. Cause he was listening to bigger pockets too. I'm like, like, yeah, dude, we're doing this many years. Like, dude, send me your bank receipts. I don't believe you. I said, <laughs> like, I, I, okay. I mean, I'm fine with that. I don't think you're, gonna, you're, you're trying to do me any harm. I think you're just curious. I just sent him like, here's the actual receipts of closing. And he was just dumbfounded. What I liked so much is his loyalty. 
And he was like, I'm going to finish up with my team, you know, and then I'm going to come work with you and I'm work for you. Cause I want to learn from you. And Tyler, he's got, you know, kind of like we we're talking at the very beginning and he's got the grit to figure it out. He knows this is what he wants to do and his dreams are bigger than his reasons. Why not? He's more justified than almost anyone else I could talk to spent five years to get an accounting degree. Did one winter in accounting is now full-time real estate investor. And what's really cool for me is to be able to pass the torch and be able to give him the reins to kind of take it on and handle and run the business and start, I think he locked up his first owner finance one yesterday actually, and start building his, um, like his portfolio and working towards it himself. Yeah, that's cool. You know, that's one thing we don't talk about enough about here is this idea of like, you know, yes, you can hire an assistant, you can hire a transaction coordinator, you can hire a uh, acquisitions manager, and that's good for you, for your business to hire somebody because you can uh, let the reins go. But we don't talk enough about is like what we're actually doing is not just providing food on someone's table, but we're equipping them to change their own life as well. And so it's like this, this multiplication effect is that if we can hire people, you're not just doing it for your own good, you're doing it for their good as well. And then they're going to be able to hire people in their future when they obtain financial independence or wealth or whatever they're, they're looking for. And uh, so if, if you're on the fence about hiring somebody, I definitely would like, you know, put some serious thought into working with other people and teaching them what you know and what you can, uh, you know, what you've learned. Because again, they're going to either, they're going to help you and they're going to help themselves, which is kind of cool. And Will mentioned something that's really important about Tyler. Well, a few things I want to point out because everybody here that's listening, you want to be a Tyler. That's how you get opportunity. Tyler's loyal. I could tell you right off the bat, a lot of people or maybe even most people are not. They, they want to come and learn what you're doing so that they can leave and go do it on their own. And if you have opportunity, there's always going to be people that tell you, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that. The minute it's harder than what they thought or they think that like they could go take some of your business with them, a lot of people will leave. And so when you're in will spot and you're picking who's the guy I'm going to give this opportunity to a track record of loyalty will take you very far when you're trying to get that opportunity. I don't think Brandon worries would Ryan ever leave me or or, or screw me over, but that's not the case for a lot of people and that he's got the grit to figure it out. Tyler says, okay, how do I got to figure this out? He doesn't think it's Will's job to teach him every single scenario that he could ever come across and say, what am I supposed to do with this? And those two qualities will get you very far. When you, I wish I had people like that that were that were coming to work because I'd love to be able to pour into someone like that and help them build wealth the same way that Tyler is. 100%. And here's the litmus test, litmus test right? I wanted him to come right over. I want to come over in January. And he said no. You know, he said, no, he was like, no, I don't want to, I'm going to, you know, I got to finish with my team. And I, I was really pushing him because I wanted him to join. And yeah. the flip side of that coin was I realized that there was a loyalty there that would, would be so tremendously valued, like in the future. And that, okay, it was actually best. All right, hold off. You know, let's just set it and let's, let's reconvene the conversation in the spring, which is what happened. So if you're looking to hire the person, a lot of people put a job post on Indeed. Those are people that are looking for work. I mean, it's one of the biggest things. It's not, um, I want to say poaching, but you share, right? That's because I posted a video. I do, I have like, I barely ever post on social media. Like for a millennial, I, I really got to get better at that because it, every single time I do, you know, something good comes of it. If you didn't see that video, it wouldn't have happened. You know, maybe I wouldn't be in business. He's been a core component of it. Yeah. He saw that video and said, I want to come to you, but here are the things that I need to do first for my team back here. Yeah, that's neat. That's neat. So to go to the bridge building thing one more time, you, you, this idea of like people build too many bridges, you built one bridge. And then the cool thing is you hired someone else to build that bridge. That's the way that you have multiple bridges. People talk about multiple streams of income. I actually think it's a horrible idea generally to try to build multiple streams of income. What, what that means is you're building multiple bridges. The way to do it though, is you build a bridge and then either you make it or you hire someone else to finish that bridge and build it for you. And then you can go and build another bridge. So it sounds like you've got somebody else building your bridge for you now. That one's going. And now you decided to move to California and do a startup. I'm just curious. Like, I know I've seen the word AI it's on the back behind you and you mentioned it earlier. What, what are you doing right now with uh, artificial intelligence? Yeah. So to take away back, I always knew just like listening to how cool, like, I feel like I'm in like the, the era before the internet, right? As to like, okay, when this internet thing comes across, here's going to be all the functionality and things that it can do. I mean, I'm seeing the studies and the use cases and the, the papers of what AI can do. And I, I just knew it was like science fiction. And I just knew that's what I, I want to do something like that with my life. And I was, you know, coming into, I turned 20 last June. So I had this blind spot. I said, what do I really want to do? And I got to tell you that blind spot got cleared through a conversation that lasted from 6 30 PM to 5 AM in a hot tub in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico at the end of a business mastermind. 
we were having super high level conversations and it was, it was hard. I was so confronted because I built this real estate and building so much traction. And I was like, wow, here's the another bridge, you know, the fog cleared and I saw the next bridge that to be built. And I realized that like, I've got goals. Like there's a, it's like a 2000 piece Lego Saturn five behind me. Like it's one of my goals is to colonize Titan by 2050, which is Saturn's largest moon. Another goal is, you know, just like kind of pioneer space travel, that stuff. It just That's excites cool. me. It's so exciting to me. It's like, you know, moving humanity forward. How am I going to do that? How many single families do I need to trade in? Right. For a rocket ship. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know the conversion right there, but it's not good. Yeah. And it, that wasn't for me. So the big thing is, I think it starts with financial freedom. You get financial freedom, right? And, yep. and then you get like creative freedom, or I would say um, like kind of thought freedom, which is you've been able to do the self-development work to get control of your emotions and be able to forge the beliefs and tear down the ones that you don't want. And then it comes up to this thing called creative freedom, which is pretty much your thoughts. You have the ability to manifest them into the world. You see a problem, you can architect a solution and build it. And that's what we're trying to do right now in AI. And the first vertical we're going into our base, our mission is remodeling customer service through conversational artificial intelligence. So, you know, when you call your bank and your healthcare yeah. provider and your insurance company, you got to wait on hold. You want yes. to do that. Anymore. You know, with all these, all these applications, you won't have to do wait. It's like such a glaring problem that no one's working on. And we were sitting here a couple of weeks ago. And we didn't know exactly the first vertical we're going into because we're building the tech and I'm getting, it's like 2 AM in our office. We're really having a think tank session. I'm getting frosted flakes from like a, someone who else, who also sublets this office space and they like sell real estate software. And the thought hit me, oh, real estate, property management, we're solving customer service. Here's how we can do this. We can do this. So what we're actually building now is a technology that allows property managers to no longer be in the trenches but to be like in the skybox seats of their business. So our AI automatically handles all the communication between vendors, owners, tenants, the logistical scheduling, the follow-up on the confirmations, everything like that. We had our first like kind of meeting with one person who actually leases us the space to get feedback. And she's like, can you get it to automatically integrate with mail and send them three day notices? And all these like problems that before were just, I got to hire someone to do that. I do that. Or it's like now a door has been open to be able to come in and give a solution because we've got the little puzzle piece, which is through text messaging and later it's going to be voice. We're able to effectively communicate and have a conversation because we take into account context in it, which is not something that no other tech company is doing. And property management is one that is near and dear to my heart because I don't think I've like pulled more hair out over the simplest things <laughs> like going back and forth with my property manager as the owner for three days playing phone tag, trying to get a report, yeah, trying to get an answer. And the more people would talk to like real estate only works if you're holding real estate. If you don't have property management or a sufficient system in place, it's not going to work. You're not going to get the returns that you're saying. It's just going to be a mess. It's the ugly duckling of real estate, which is it's one of the most challenging businesses I feel in this vertical and we're bringing what we can to say, what if we took the time intensive part that's been out of your control up to this point, and now it became in your control, which is- That's cool. Thing. That's cool. What's the company going to be called or what's it called? So it's called Achieve Intelligent Technologies, Inc. So with that, let's move on uh, to a segment of the show that I love near and dear to my heart. It's the deal deep dive. All right, Will. So this is the part of the show where we dive deep into one real estate deal that you've done and just kind of get the nitty gritty details on it. So do you got something in mind that we can pick apart? Oh yeah, I got, I got a good one. All right. Awesome. So first of all, let's start with this question. What kind of property is it and where is it located? So this is a single family brick ranch located in Virginia beach. And it's like four bedrooms, three baths, like 3000 square feet. Okay. Number nice. how did, how'd you find that deal? We found that deal. I think that came through our RVM marketing. We had a couple ringless, of them at the time. Yeah. yeah, ringless voicemails. Cool. Okay. How, how much was the property? Like, how much did they want? And then what'd you end up paying for it? Yeah. So it's an interesting, there's a couple really good nuggets in here because I almost didn't do this deal. 
because the guy comes in, he says, Hey, the guy I'm speaking to, he lives in Kentucky. You know, he, his sister was living in the house and the mom had just passed. He's like, we, oh, I know the house is trashed and we just got to sell it. So we're having a show in at this time, go out there, you know, and take a look and let me know what you can offer. I was like, Oh man, you know, bidding wars, people pay are kind of paying some dumb prices in this, in this market. I don't think there's be something, but I go out there and it was the first property I actually went out there with Sydney and she's taking pictures and I'm walking around and there's like five other companies out there walking through a bunch of people, you know, taking pictures, taking notes, just like we are. It's kind of awkward as you know, showing what sellers usually are with when there's multiple people and pretty much, I don't think he had an initial asking price, but I call him back the next day after it. And there was, like I said, five other people and I almost didn't call him back. I almost deleted this lead because like, there's no way I'm going to get it. There were so many people out there. I recognize some of them. They're at the RIAs and I call them, you know, but the one thing I focused on up to it because I knew I was going to be in a bidding war is how do I build the best level of rapport with this person yeah. I've ever built in my entire life? Let me be their best friend. Let me give them this authentic, just all the way. I, and it just felt natural to me. It wasn't like I didn't have to fake it. I didn't have to force it. I was, I'm just going to be this person's best friend. So I talked to him and he sounds a little sad on the phone. I'm like, you know, what, what's going on? And he's like, you know, they, they came back, they offered us 195. I think my, I was willing to kind of offer like in the mid twos, um, but he was like 195. I was like, wow, that's, that's really low. Like for me, that's really low. They, they offer you that. I was like, yeah. He's like, have you gotten any other offers? He's like, no, no one else has called me back. Five companies went out there. No one, no one really made him offer. It's like, okay, so, well, let me ask you, like, I mean, you probably ran this across, you know, your, your brothers and sisters. I mean, what do you guys want? What would you be willing to let it go for? He said like 225. So I was like, okay. 225. All right. Yeah. That let me just, let me just rerun our numbers. Check. I'm pretty sure that could work and we could probably do that. So we lock it up with them at 225. A week later, because that's kind of how we do it with our disposition. A little quick tip is we have our buyers list and then we basically hold a showing for properties for buyers. Um, unless it's like vacant and there's a lockbox and there's nothing there. Like inside of that, someone could possibly steal because we've had issues with that before. Sure. But we have the showing and we have like eight people line up and this is, this is prime real estate in a prime, like Kempsville neighborhood of Virginia beach. And it's just like the ideal flip property you need a ton of work and had the capacity to be super beautiful in a, in a neighborhood where homes were selling 350,000 to like 450,000. So uh, we have the showing people come and go and people are kind of giving me figures. I'm kind of like, well, you know, well, I don't know. I don't know. Here's the biggest thing. I, you know, we talk about the things that's like, you know, kind of like, you know, being afraid of rejection. So many people like as buyers just don't give offers, I guess, because they, they don't know what they're doing or they don't feel that offer is going to be good enough. Yeah. And that's reflect badly somehow on them. So like most people, like, and I think, and I talked to, and I, we have people that come out to multiple of our properties. And they just never give an offer. They never throw their hat in the ring to say, okay, what is it? Cause I'm usually yeah. pretty flexible on our prices, right? I'm, I'm, I'm more about getting this deal done to get to the next. So this guy got, didn't get that many offers. And we had to like track down these eight people. And I remember I was back, like when we had a two bedroom apartment, the other guy had moved out. So I was using the other bedroom as an office. And she's like, Hey, I just got an email back from Jim. Jim was a guy who was like, kind of, kind of like big time in the, uh, in the area. And he says, you know, you guys are in luck. I'm flipping a property right around the corner of the other street. And I would love to take down two at the same time. My offer, right? So I have it at 225, $1,000 over any other offer up to 281,000. I didn't even know how much that was. I couldn't do the math, <laughs> in my head. but I got a sick feeling in my stomach. And I was like, what the heck? Cause it was just completely unexpected because from our buyers, we'd also gotten cash offers of 205 and 235. And 255. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, was like, it was like so above and beyond. So That's basically, huge. Said, and I think like two, 270. We were like, okay, if you can do 277, like you got this deal. And he says, okay, okay, deal. And I basically walk, and I remember I walked to Subway and I clue in everyone, all the contacts that I have at the title company, like my marketing partner at the time, everyone would say, like, this, I'm going to be like mother, um, like <laughs> the mother bird here and protect this thing like it's my baby bird. <laughs> Good thing I said that because the, for the issues that were to come down the line with getting it to actually close, so many lessons in it, it was absolutely necessary. So we got everyone on board, we started things, I was like, okay, we're gonna be absolutely 
you know, seamless on this. They run the title search right a week later. And I got an email back saying, you know, Hey, Will, I, uh, I got some interesting news here. It turns out one of the daughters has a $120,000 judgment attached. To oh no. $120,000 judgment. So it's like, I don't know what that means. And like, well, we don't know. It's kind of, you know, biggest, we got to draw the dots. It was the most complicated title that I've ever had because it was like they had to connect with like all these different hospitals and this and this and this. I think it was like four weeks later of drawing lots and connections and fact finding. I was actually like skiing with my family last February. And I finally got the email, like the clear to close after going through all that because they'd finally connected that the like bankruptcy she had filed in like 2001, you know, covered or whatever, negated the judgment on it. And that it wasn't because I mean, a hundred thousand dollars, like that was a, that's a pill to swallow. Yeah. You know what I mean? You taken out of a deduction. I think they owed like 40,000 or 50,000. So they had a bunch of equity. But they, they wouldn't have had it, you know, before. So it was just, I would say on that perseverance because there were so many things. I got a $53,000 deal here on the line. And when people aren't picking up my calls, when things aren't that, I'm showing up to the title companies in person in the office saying, what's going on? I put everything else on hold, right? Back to your one thing, what's your most important priority? It was not about getting new leads. It was not about how do I get other deals or solve the other problems? How do I solve the immediate task here? Because if I can solve this one, this is the one that's going to have the biggest payoff and move us forward. All right. Well, that covered a lot of the, the kind of the last few, how do you, like, you, it was a wholesale deal. So you didn't have to really fund it, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I signed it. Yep. Yeah. Right, perfect. And then the rest of the, what'd you do with it? We know that you wholesale it. What was the outcome? You kind of talked about that. So what was the, uh, what was the final profit then that you actually walked away with? So at the time I was still on a 50, 50 marketing agreement. So I walked away okay. with the check for like 26,000 from the 53,000, like 26,500 which to me at the time, I did not nearly have the overhead that I do now. That was, that was completely like game changing. Yeah. I've been doing like, you know, 4,000, 7,000, you know, $8,000 deals. And for that one, but it's, it's, again, it's the lessons that were learned on it that I get to keep with me. That money has been spent. Yeah. Yeah. That money is cool. invested, but it's the lessons. No one can take those away from me. Yeah. That's awesome, man. All right. Last question, David. What did you learn from this deal? I learned first, and foremost, that there is power in being open to possibilities and being willing to say, I don't know how exactly this is going to turn out, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. Yeah. Example A or exhibit A, making the call to the guy, even though there were five other people there. I had no idea they gave, one of them gave, gave the guy, I don't know if they just, they didn't know what they were doing. They just gave him a super low ball offer on purpose, but I had no idea. And I almost didn't call the guy. I learned that in cases of bidding wars, probably the only reason I got that. Cause here's the thing. One week later, another one of the buyers finally got back to them with an offer of 235, 10,000 above. But my rapport with the guy was worth to him more than $10,000. Cause I basically told them, you know, that there's gonna be some issues with this and we're going to get you through it. And I'm just going to keep you updated and posted the whole way. We're not going to bag on it no matter, you know, kind of where we get to. So the level yeah. of rapport that I had with him and then not, you know, be not taking the first offer that we got, that was like two thirty. but seeing and looking around now, one of our favorite things to do is when we buy a house, see who's flipped them in the neighborhood because they can, if they can comp off their own property. Now that almost eliminates all risk for the flipper because they knew that one and they know the floor plan. And they just another one they can do it again. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on that one. And like you said, the lessons are more valuable than even the profits. So uh, thank you for sharing those. And now we're going to move on to the last segment of the show. It's our famous, famous four. All right. So let's get to the world famous, famous four. Question number one, Will. Favorite real estate related book? I spent 18 months trying to come up with one that would be different. But mm -hmm. I, gotta, I gotta bring it back to basics. You guys know what's coming. Rich Dad, <laughs> all yeah. the way. It's the one because it's not super technical, but it invents a possibility that's an alternate reality to that. Maybe you might be living, or you may have thought that there is a new way to live life. And here's kind of how you might start going about it. It's poorly mindset. It juiced me up. I remember reading it. That was the first book I read because it was recommended on the podcast. And I think that's where a lot of people got their start. What about your favorite business book? Oh man, my favorite business book. It's without a doubt, the one thing 
because you know, and you love it, geometric progression, one thing is just, it, it applies everywhere. And whenever I'm trying to solve a problem, I actually go back, open up that book and go back to some of the principles. One thing by sure, but one thing for sure by Gary Keller. Okay. And how about some of your favorite hobbies? So my hobbies, um, since moving out here to LA, I really like going to the beach. I like hiking. There's some good hiking around here. I like to, to work out a lot. It clears my mind and I'm going to go with a, a good classic. I, I like sleeping. Sleeping. Classic, 20 year old hobby. It's probably one of the, my favorite things. I, I enjoy the sleeping as well. That's awesome, man. Well, Hey, all right. So let's go. Uh, last question. What do you think separates successful real estate investors from all those who give up, they fail, or they never get started? Yeah. So I thought about this because I know it's coming. And I think almost if I can condense everything into it is being brutally honest with yourself about your plan A and not having a plan B. Oh, that's right. I talked about that with, uh, with Josh Dorkin the other day. I was doing Josh Dorkin has a new podcast. And we're talking about we were watching Shark Tank and Barbara Corkin was tearing this lady apart because she had a plan B like on Shark Tank. She was like, well, I got, you know, my parents pay for my rent and so I don't really have any expenses and they kind of take care of me. And she's like, I ain't, I'm out. I'm not investing because you have a plan B. That's what you're kind of saying. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we can trick ourselves into thinking that our plan A is a good one. Mm. You know? And then if you have a, if you don't have a good plan A and you don't have a plan B, that's a recipe for failure. That's a recipe for fire and disaster. But being brutally honest and getting brutally honest, like feedback from people that you respect, right? Send people DM on Instagram. Hey, what do you think about this? Can I pick your brain for a second about your long-term vision? At the end of the day, right? If your plan A has you doing the processes and it's the actions inside of it are actions that you take and you love doing, you really can't go wrong. If your plan A is, well, I'm going to do this and I, I really don't like doing this, but it's going to get me here, it's probably not going to work because like you said, it's not about easy. It's about, there's going to be, you know, trials and tribulations, but being honest with yourself and say, you know, if I only did one thing for the rest of my life, would, would, is this like what I would want to do or am I doing this to try and get somewhere else? That's what I would yeah. say. Good answer, man. Good answer. Wow. All right. So for people that want to know more, where can they find out more about you, Will? Yeah. So I'm also going to leave some of the, the links to some of the tech that I, I put about here. And if you want to get on our, our newsletter and may, maybe because you own properties, you want your property manager to kind of take a look at our tech or you're a property manager yourself and you want to automate, we're going to set up a URL here. It's called ariestech.ai. That's A-R-E-S-T-E-C-H.ai. I'll throw up a couple of the links up there and put in a spot to put your email in. And then also you can follow me on Instagram and see the time that I post every six months. And that is will.jbrown. Send me a message awesome. there. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. But if you're just going to start it, I'm, we're going to ask you to go door knock 100 doors. So keep that in mind. I love that. That's so cool, man. I'm going to start doing that too. I think when people ask me for, uh, for a device, I'll be like, yeah, just go, go door knock 100 doors. That's cool, man. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been awesome. Uh, really appreciate having you on the show today. So uh, we're going to get out of here. But uh, of course, everyone check out the show notes. Uh, you can get links to all the stuff that Will talked about there as well. And uh, you can leave a comment there. Talk to Will there. Uh, go check out all his links, his sites, and uh, all this cool stuff he's doing. So again, thank you very much, Will. This has been awesome. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Happy to give right. back. Thanks, man. David? Yes, yes, sir. This is David Green for Brandon, the beautiful beard turner, signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.